Okay, so today we'll be talking about old field habitats and more specifically the golden rods within these. So what is an old field habitat? Well, it is a field that without management over time will develop into a forest, but is typically in between that transitional stage. Old fields are most likely formed on previously managed land like abandoned agricultural or pasture land after the management has stopped. Uh, they're typically characterized by herbs, grasses, and heaths, as well as shrub trees and other things like that. Now, because there are no large trees, there's typically no shade provided, moisture conserved, or wind blocked, and this results in a very stressful habitat. So very hardy plants typically survive well here. Golden rods are a part of the aster family. There are 110 roughly species in this aster family. They are a herbaceous perennial species typically found in meadows, old fields, and roadsides. Uh, they look over here on the right like very tall bright yellow tops. Uh, they're kind of everywhere down here and they may be brown whenever we go out, but especially once spring starts to pick up and everything starts to bloom, you'll see them probably everywhere. Um, they're strong competitors that use interference competition in the form of oleochemicals to suppress the growths of other nearby competing plants. And because they are a super abundant plant in old field ecosystems, they are very attractive to herbivores. So whenever we go out and what we're specifically looking for are galls in the goldenrod, and we'll get into what those are in just a minute. But specifically, we're looking for apple galls or ball galls. They kind of are about the size of a ping pong ball, and they'll be on the stem of the goldenrod. Uh, there are tons of different types of galls, and the ones that we are specifically looking for in this lab are the uh, ball-sized ones. There are some that look like flowers, some that are like cylindrical. So just kind of aim for ones that are nice and big and round like that. So what are galls? Galls are formed by the goldenrod gall fly. Uh, they will burrow into the goldenrod stem, lay their eggs inside of it, and then after that egg hatches about 10 days later, the larvae will kind of eat its way a little bit deeper into the stem and form a feeding chamber. Uh, this will then kind of stimulate the goldenrod itself to kind of add more mass around that area. Uh, this then also provides more space to feed on the goldenrod stem itself for the gall, the gall fly. And the interior of this goldenrod stem is kind of more a consistency of damp wood. Um, so it's a little hardy. It's not very easy for things to get into and it's a very protected space. Now these galls will go in there in about fall and then kind of spend the winter in there hibernating, eating, uh, goldenrod itself and developing. And during the winter, the mostly mature quarter inch long fly will slow down its metabolism, kind of hibernate and replace much of its internal water with glycerol, which prevents it from freezing. Uh, the larvae will then diapause until spring or kind of hibernate until spring. When the warm day is stimulated, it'll find its way out of the goldenrod stem and then repeat the process again, go find a new goldenrod, lay the larvae, and just kind of repeat this over and over and over. So while this seems really bad for the plant, it typically doesn't cause any major growth or issues for the plant itself. However, because the galls are living plant tissue that requires nutrients, gall formations can be problematic if the plants are very young or if there are a lot of galls on the plant. So here we can see on the right there are multiple galls on the same stem on the furthest left plant. So because these are a source of food for predatory vertebrates and invertebrates, um, and they are very common and very stationary, this makes them an easy target for exploitative interactions. Now, exploitative interactions are those where one organism has a fitness benefit, so the thing eating the other thing, and the other organism has a fitness cost, so it gets eaten. And parasitites and parasitoids are specialists, meaning that they typically only eat one or a few type of prey species. So this will be a wasp in this case, and there are also generalist predators that eat many different things. So this would be birds in this case. 
So buried predators are a generalist predator of the goldenrod fly. Uh, one of the most common bird predators is the downy woodpecker because they are small insectivorous birds and they can drill through wood or any other things to pull out insects. Uh, they have this really weird tongue that like goes all the way around their head. Uh, it does a couple things, but it also helps prevent da brain damage in woodpeckers. It's kind of interesting. And then wasps uh, are in particular are parasitoids whenever they predate goldenrod galls. So it only predates this one thing. And it will use its short pointed ovipositor to penetrate the gall and lay its eggs inside of the chamber. And the success of this attack is dependent on the thickness of the gall wall and the ovipositor length. So basically, large thick galls are predated by birds and small thin galls are predated by wasps. And the wasps in particular will then lay their eggs inside of the gall. Their eggs will then eat the gall fly that's inside and then it kind of takes over. So this results in variation in gall size dependent on what predators are there. So remember that natural selection only acts when heritable traits are non-randomly impacted and the survivorship and reproduction of individuals with those traits are compared to those without. So if there's a lot of bird predators in the area versus a lot of wasp predators in the area, it may result in an overall change in size of the galls themselves. So in exploitative interactions, there is often a co-evolution or reciprocal evolution between the consumer and the consumed. Mm -hmm. And these can result in some crazy adaptations to be able to avoid being eaten or to consume prey. So this ant in the top right hand corner has extremely venomous stings and can kill a one pound rat in three stings. And then this lizard down in the bottom can shoot blood out of its eyes to avoid predation. So these occurrences are not just things that happen in textbooks. These happen all the time, all over the world and pretty constantly. So in this lab, we're going to investigate interactions in old field systems on one of the most dominant plants of the system, the goldenrod. We're going to be investigating the interactions among their inhabitants by measuring gall sizes and looking for evidence of exploitative interactions. And ultimately, we're going to try and answer, does the size of the gall have anything to do with the chance of the fly larvae surrounding or surviving? So for this lab, we're going to be filling out a predictions worksheet, kind of just taking a guess of what we think we're going to find and consider a couple different situations that we'll talk about in lab. And then we're going to record these predictions for the predictions worksheet. So the protocol for this lab is going to be uh, the field work itself. So we're going to go out and meet at the Arboretum. I will send an email to y'all uh, with the GPS kind of coordinates and drop a pin on it so that y'all can find it easily. If y'all have never been out to the Arboretum before, it can be kind of confusing trying to get out there. Uh, basically, if you're still, if the coordinates don't really help, uh, going to South Campus, there's going to be kind of a road that'll transition into a gravel road and go by some veterinary areas. Just keep going. There'll be a sign that points through a gate that says like archery range or something like that. Follow that gravel road to the right and you'll reach it. Uh, I'll drop a pin right on the gate and send that to y'all in an email. So after we collect the data, we'll be going back to the computer lab, uh, entering the data into an Excel sheet as a class, downloading the data, calculating some central tendencies, and using a statistical program to make histograms. So the predictions worksheet should be turned into me before you leave lab, and the top hat lab worksheet should be completed this Friday by midnight.